Good evening. The handover is done. The ceremonies and celebrations over. A century and a half of British rule in Hong Kong is simply history tonight. China is in charge now. It's already Tuesday in Hong Kong, the first dawn of a new era. A very rainy dawn. In spite of the terrible weather, Hong Kong's new flag and the Chinese flag were raised over all of Hong Kong's government buildings. A day of firsts then in Hong Kong, but for that it also of course had to be a day of lasts. And that's what this was, Hong Kong's last day as a British colony. Our coverage begins with our Asia correspondent Raymond St-Pierre on the handover. On this last day of colonial rule, British troops bade farewell to Hong Kong. 10,000 guests braved the tropical downpour to watch them parade and salute the end of 156 years of British history. Speaking for the last time before leaving the colony, Governor Chris Patton expressed his faith in the people of this dynamic territory. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. That is the promise, and that is the unshakable destiny. The Hong Kong night sky then lit up in an array of colors as spectacular fireworks illuminated Victoria Harbor. Prince Charles, representing the Queen, then led the British delegation to the Hong Kong Convention Center where the handover ceremony took place. Jiang Zemin, the first Chinese president ever to set foot in Hong Kong, headed the Chinese delegation. A British and a Chinese guard of honor walked on stage to signal the start of the transition to Chinese rule. Prince Charles so promised Britain would not abandon Hong Kong. We shall not forget you, and we shall watch with the closest interest as you embark on this new era of your remarkable history. Seconds before midnight, the British flag was lowered to the strains of God Save the Queen. The Chinese army band then played the Chinese national anthem to signal the moment that Hong Kong became a special administrative region of China. President Jiang Zemin welcomed back the citizens of Hong Kong to the motherland, promising to implement the policy of one country, two systems to protect its autonomy. The Hong Kong residents shall enjoy various rights and freedoms according to law. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall gradually develop a democratic system that suits Hong Kong's reality. Prince Charles and ex-Governor Patton said their goodbyes, now guests of the Chinese government. Meanwhile, most of the other 4,000 invited dignitaries attended the swearing-in of Tong Chi Hua, the first chief executive of Hong Kong appointed by Beijing. Chinese Premier Li Pong then swore in the unelected members of the new provisional legislature, an event the U.S. and Britain boycotted at the ministerial level. Lloyd Axworthy, Canada's foreign affairs minister, did attend. Then it was time for Prince Charles and Chris Patton to sail away on the royal yacht Britannia closing the curtain on a century and a half of history and handing communist China one of the most fiercely capitalistic societies. Raymond Saint-Pierre, CBC News, Hong Kong, China. So Hong Kong is now a fiercely capitalistic society wrapped in a communist embrace with Chinese soldiers on its soil. For many, Hong Kong's return to China is cause for great joy. For others, great concern. Tom Kennedy now on the new reality. Just before the handover, away from the pomp and the fireworks, a small ceremony that hammered home what is happening. The old Prince of Wales barracks, home to the soldiers who garrison Hong Kong, was vacated. Prince of Wales barracks is now ready for transfer to your care. The British moved out, and an advance guard of the People's Liberation Army of China moved in. Just one small vignette in a long night of much more colorful ceremonies. But the handful of people who witnessed it saw clearly. Hong Kong has a new master. The more popular show downtown was a few blocks away. 
Hong Kong's democracy movement is known for its sense of drama, and some people in the former colony were calling this show the balcony scene. Thousands crowded into a small square to hear Martin Lee, a democratic leader who is as respected as he is popular. He and his supporters climbed to the balcony of the building that was home to a democratically elected legislature until China ordered it dissolved last week. That the flame of democracy has been ignited in Hong Kong. It was a not very subtle warning to China that the democracy movement is strong. And if China breaks its promise of allowing elections, there will be consequences. The whole world is looking at us. Long live democracy. Long live democracy. But there remains in Hong Kong that persistent unknown. What will unification mean? In the crowd, an old man, one of communism's early dissidents. In the 50s, he spent six years in a Chinese jail. I'm scared, he says bluntly. Also in the crowd, a younger dissident, Han Dong Fong, was jailed after the Tiananmen Square massacre. I will try my best to stay, to stay out of jail and continue my work. So there is an impression of a worried population faced with a communist menace. In fact, most people in the colony didn't even go to the celebrations. They were at home or out shopping, still working in some cases. Sometimes the celebrations on television were simply ignored. We've been under British rule for more than a century, he says. I'm happy they're gone, but I've got to go to work. Six hours after handover, 4,000 Chinese troops flooded into Hong Kong. Many countries have criticized China for showing force here too quickly. As for Hong Kong, it can only hope that as a new uncertain era of its history begins, these people are here to protect them, not police them. Tom Kennedy, CBC News, Hong Kong, China. In Beijing, a moment to savor and celebrate. There were fireworks and cheers in Tiananmen Square. The handover ceremony was shown on a giant screen as 100,000 people watched. People were watching in Canada, too. Some whose past links them to the old British colony, others whose future lies with the new Hong Kong. Terry Malewski now with the view from here. For years, they've been coming to Canada to get away from communism in China or the threat of it in Hong Kong. Even so, Chinese Canadians celebrated the handover of Hong Kong and fought back tears of pride as they saw the red flag rise. It's um, a very moving moment, I mean, to us. Both sadness and, and uh, we, at the same time, we feel proud, I mean, as a nation of China, they, they should be proud of it. Only a few small protests were held to mark the occasion. A statement was read in Vancouver. Only a handful of people showed up in Toronto, and just one protester appeared at the Chinese embassy in Ottawa. The image of China as an ogre to be feared seems to have faded. Many of the Chinese immigrants who flocked to Canada over the past 15 years came because they feared that free enterprise would be stifled in Hong Kong. Today, many of them believe their enterprise will be a lot freer in Hong Kong than it is in Canada. That's why people like Charles Kern, a millionaire toy manufacturer, have voted with their feet and returned to Hong Kong. Kern fled China as a boy, went to Hong Kong and finally to Canada. But after nine years here, he says he'll reclaim Chinese citizenship because high taxes and bureaucracy have made Canada bad for business. Too much paperwork. In Hong Kong, Kern will pay just 15% in income tax, and he says he'll get much richer much quicker. He believes the China he ran away from is no more. I think China is a large change compared to 30 years ago. Kern's departure is not unusual. He's part of a growing trend. We're talking about in the thousands. You know, we're not talking about you know, 100 people or 200 people. We're talking about thousands. Mason Lowe is a well-known lawyer who says Canadian taxes and unemployment are driving investors and young people alike back to Hong Kong. So maybe they're taking John Chrétien, our prime minister's advice. You know, if they can't find a job in one province, they move to another. If they can't find a job in one country, they ought to move to another country. Still, the vast majority of immigrants are staying. 
Car dealer David Ho says Canada's social safety net is worth paying all those taxes. That justifies a lot for people to stay here. This is home. My luck in here. There's no plan to move back. Terry Huey's here for the long haul. He's changing the Vancouver skyline with a massive building project. But Charles Kern sees better prospects in China. And time will tell how many follow in his footsteps. Tori Maleski, CBC News, Vancouver.